Pour yourself a sweet tea, pull up a lawn chair, and turn the page with us. You're listening to Right on Mississippi, a podcast taking you inside the minds of America's most treasured wordsmiths. I'm Ebony Lamumba, and Right on Mississippi is produced in partnership with Mississippi Public Broadcasting for the Mississippi Book Festival, the South's Literary Lawn Party. Okay, welcome everyone uh, to the Meet Me in the Middle panel at the Mississippi uh, Book Festival. I'm Sarah Frances Hardy, so I am the moderator and I'm just a moderator. So we are gonna hear from our incredible middle grade authors this morning. Uh, thank you all for being here. I'm sorry, we're not in person, but I really am glad that we can be here and talk about your books. So I'm going to start out, I'm going to just do a super quick intro for each of you. And then after that, um, I'd love for each of you to just tell us what your book is about. So I'm going to start, uh, let me start with you, Gilbert, Gilbert Ford, Race Wave. Uh, so Gilbert grew up in Jackson, Mississippi, and he and I actually, we were talking right before we got on screen, we shared an art teacher who, who is now also a children's book author. So uh, it's kind of fun to have that connection. So Gilbert graduated from the Pratt Institute and he has a master's in fine arts and writing for children and young adults from the Vermont College of Fine Arts. He's the author illustrator of Flying Lessons, The Marvelous Thing That Came From a Spring and How the Cookie Crumbled. Those are all books he has been the author illustrator of. He has also illustrated tons of other books. And Gilbert, you are very well known for your incredible iconic book covers. I love um, going to my independent bookstore and you can spot the bright color, wonderful Gilbert Ford book covers that are on the shelf. And also I, I should add, please go to all of these authors' websites because I'm just hitting the high points of everything they have done. Gilbert has, has had quite an incredible career, won lots of awards, lots of illustration awards. So we're going to be talking today about Gilbert's debut middle grade novel, The Mysterious Messenger, uh, published by Macmillan. It came out in July of 2020, and it was a, a, a really fun book to read in, you know, in the summer of 2020 when we were all home reading. So this is the Mysterious Messenger. Next, let's see, we'll do Carrie Sign. So Carrie, thank you for being here this morning. Carrie is the creator of the Flying Flamingo Sisters, which is a best-selling Audible series. And if you are going on a road trip with your children, listen to this because it is fabulous. Uh, Carrie has served as a staff writer for several Nickelodeon comedy shows. She's written essays. Um, she has essays on awkwardness in the book, Mortified, Life is a Battlefield. She has been a journalist and an essayist writing for the New York Times, the Atlantic, Cosmopolitan, the New York Post, many, many more. So um, check out her website for more information. Again, I just, I don't even have time to talk about how wonderful all of you are. Uh, Carrie is the author of Horse Girl, and that is her debut middle grade novel. And we'll be talking about that today. And then finally, we have Alda P. Dobbs. And Alda was born in a small town in northern Mexico, but moved to San Antonio, Texas as a child. Alda studied physics. Congratulations. We, we all bow to you. Um, and worked as an engineer before pursuing her love of storytelling. Alda's written for several magazines, including Highlights magazines, and has won numerous writing awards. And Alda and her husband live outside of Houston, Texas, and this is her debut middle grade novel, The Barefoot Dreams of Petra Luna. When does it come out? It comes out September 14th. So. Okay, so very soon, but go ahead, go ahead and pre-order this because you you want it. Oh yeah, if you pre-order right now, they have a, a journal. You get a Barefoot Dreams journal oh. with it too. So <laughs> oh, how cool! Okay, very good, very good. Well, why don't why don't we start with you? Why don't you give us just the quick pitch of your book and let us know what it's about and no sure. spoilers. 
<laughs> no problem. Yeah, I got the, the box to the hardcover already. So I'm really excited about it. They say it's good luck to to uh, put it under your pillow for the first time, you know, the first night when you get them. So I did that <laughs> for good luck. And uh, it's about 12 year old Petra Luna. And she will stop at nothing to keep her family safe during the Mexican Revolution back in 1913. And uh, at the same time, she's trying to keep her family safe. She's also uh, keeping the, that, that was her promise to her father to keep her family safe. But she's also trying to hang on to her dreams, which are to learn to read and write. And it was inspired by my great grandmother, who also endured the, the Mexican Revolution and who also had dreams of, of learning to read and write. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I loved it. I really couldn't put it down and um, started it at night, which, you know, I thought I, I read the first chapter and I, well, okay, no, no sleep. No sleep. <laughs> um, all right, let's see, Carrie, Horse Girl. Yes. So Horse Girl is a kind of a coming of age story of a young girl named Willa who's obsessed with horses, but she's never had a chance to ride a horse or take lessons until her parents moved to a new town and they let her enroll in a prestigious riding academy, which seems to be fantastic until she gets there and encounters a group of mean girls who've been riding for a really long time and are less than welcoming and she gets paired up with an elderly rescue horse who's really not that interested in walking, trotting, jumping, anything, just really snacking. Um, so she's navigating the obstacles and perils of, of learning to ride a horse and the obstacles and perils of being a tween girl. Um, so that's, yeah, that's Horse Girl. Yeah, I love it. I have a, a, a horse daughter, so I... Ah. Um... I, I've, I've got this. I just, I, I told her after today, she could have it. <laughs> it, I enjoyed it so, so much. So, and so funny. <laughs> so Thank funny. You. Um, all right. Gilbert Ford, the mysterious messenger. Hi. Um, first, I'd like to thank the Mississippi Book Festival for having me. And it's nice to meet you, Carrie and Alda and Sarah. Um, okay. So mysterious messenger is about an 11 year old girl named Maria Rousseau who lives with her fake psychic mother who cons widows out of their inheritance. But Maria is keeping a big secret from her mother and that is that she can really speak to a ghost named Edward. One day after conning a widow out of her inheritance, Edward contacts Maria and tells her she needs to follow the widow home and find treasure hidden inside her apartment. So begins this long journey of Maria escaping under the thumb of her mother and um, meeting new friends along the way. So that is the story. Thank you, Gilbert. Yeah, I, um, I we were we were talking. Ellen and I were were talking before we we got all got on camera. Ellen Ellen Rogers Daniels and um, talking about what a bomb your book was. It came out, you know, right in the summer of 2020, and just what a joy it was to read and to read Maria's journey. Um, well, I've got you, Gilbert. Why don't why don't we talk about um, so all three of you? This is your debut middle grade, which is which is cool. I, as different as all of your books were, there were so many common threads, and uh, so it, it'll be fun to to talk about that with all three of you. And one one of the common threads is that all of you, this is your debut middle grade, and you've all done different things. So can you talk? Um, Gilbert, tell us how you how you arrived at middle grade. Um, also, just a little bit about the difference illustrating a middle grade because you've done wonderful interior illustrations and how that's different from your other illustration work. So two questions. Okay. Okay. And I'm going to hold up some of your. OK, yeah. So I I got into middle grade because I was an illustrator um, around 2007. I got this, um, the name of this book is Secret Series to Illustrate. And um, after that, I just got tons of middle grade novels. And I started reading them because um, I wanted to, I took the covers very seriously and I wanted to make sure that you know, the covers portrayed what was in the books. But I fell in love with reading the uh, middle grade novels as I was working on the covers. And I got a ton of covers. So for about 13 years, I read nothing but middle grade. Yeah. And um, I ended up going to school to, um, to Vermont College of Fine Arts for um, writing to children and young, young adults to actually write picture books. But they asked me to try writing a middle grade novel in the program. And um, I just, it just stuck. I loved it. So 
that's how I got there. The difference between illustrating picture books in middle grade is, well, first of all, it's black and white. So mm -hmm. interior illustrations yeah. are black and white. They have to be high contrast so that you can actually see the, um, when it prints on cheap paper, mm -hmm. you kind of see it doesn't, small details don't get lost. And you just want to entice the reader um, every chapter. Something, one of the most exciting parts of this, the chapter that they're about to read to get them to keep reading as they go along. And that's it. Um, I loved um, your characters, especially the psychic uh, mother who's so over the top and her, um, her outfits, like, I don't know if you can see, but um, she's just, she's wonderful. The outfits and the fur coats and just um, I, that, that added a lot to me as a reader, to her character, to, to see her. Um, all right, uh, Alda, how about you? You, you said your, your grandmother inspired this story. Um, so tell us about your road to writing middle grade. Well, this is actually the first book ever <laughs> that I've written, so pretty wow. Is. But uh, I, I always had a love hate relationship with English growing up because English was my my second language, and I, I found it so difficult to to learn. But in the back of my head, I've always loved storytelling, and uh, not until I got to college and took the placement test, and I scored remedial for English, <laughs> and that's when I said, you know what that's a sign. I'm not meant to do this. So, but inside my heart, I wanted to tell stories. So I just put it in the back burner. I pursued engineering and physics and, uh, and I always collected stories in my head and, and read books and whatnot. And, and 10 years ago, that's when I decided to take the plunge. I said, okay, I'm doing this. I, I have to, you know, it's just in me and it's waiting to come out. So I started writing articles for magazines and whatnot. And and I thought about my great grandmother's story and I started typing the article and decided to do the research to find out if the events were actually true or not. It took months of reading and researching newspapers, archives and whatnot. And when I finally found that headline in the newspaper from 1913, I, that's when I said, okay, it did really happen. So I got to make a, write a picture book about this. So oh. I went on and wrote a, a picture book that was about 1500 words. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, I didn't know what I was doing, but uh, so I kept taking it to conferences and they kept saying, no, it's too long, the voice and whatnot. And after a couple of years, one agent said she loved it and she asked for the whole thing. She wanted to read the whole thing. And I said, well, you're, you're holding the whole thing. It's a picture book. And she said, oh, it's a picture book. I thought it was a chapter. And I said, no, it's a picture book. I said, no, you got to turn this into a, a novel. This would be a great novel. You know, there's, I want to see what happens to the character, what happened before. And that's when I said, okay, I'll, I'll do it. You know, and it took another five years to sure. get that done. So yeah, that was my, my process. So it started out as a, an wow. article. <laughs> to well, became an that, so uh, two, two questions. So did that agent end up being your agent or? or no, I ended up getting a, a different agent. Different but, agent. But I always feel so grateful that no she, kidding. she saw the conferences that, are know. great. I, um, a, a I think a lot of people go to conferences thinking they're going to land an agent or land a book deal. And usually what they land is the best advice ever or some wonderful teaching moment. That same thing happened to me. So mm -hmm. and I like, I'm, I'm glad to hear your story. Um, I have to ask, so was the picture book, was it that opening chapter? Was it that story of-, of It was actually that? the opening, the scene for the picture book was a scene that starts book two, which is the follow-up to Barefoot Dreams. Oh, good. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, so, I'm glad. Oh, I'm so glad there's a book two. Okay, great. Yes, yes this one takes place in Mexico during the Mexican Revolution sure. and her trying to get away. And book two follows her into Where's the she? United States, yeah. you know, oh, as a oh. refugee and trying to make yeah. it, make ends wow. meet or not. Wow. Okay, great. Um, all right, Carrie, how, tell us how you got, got to middle grade. Well, I have the unusual story of meeting my agent in a canoe, which is not at all typical, but I had been, um, I came from a comedy background, background performing with the Groundlings in Los Angeles and writing for a couple of Nickelodeon shows, which is more of a sketch comedy, like an SNL oh. style for kids. 
and a mutual friend had invited a couple of people out on his canoe in Long Island. And there was, I met my editor in the boat and he said, oh, you write for children's television. I'm looking for a funny kids book. Do you have any ideas? And it just went from there. And, and wow. I, uh, so I mentioned horse girl. My sister was a big horse girl riding uh-huh. horses. And he said, great. But then I was terrified. He said, go ahead. You know, I was, I have no idea how to write a book. I've never written. I write little short sketches and scenes and articles. They're very brief. I can get them done quickly. Um, but my friend encouraged me, just write the chapter. Just write the first yeah. chapter. That's all it is. And then, and then they bought the book on the first chapter and I had to write it, so. Wow. <laughs> uh, it was a wild, very unusual story, but also, you know, very exciting. That, yeah, that's incredible. And, and, and how wonderful. Um, I, I, I can see I, I, when you were saying you, you wrote little sketch comedies, th- I mean, there's a there's definitely a thread and a plot and you're being pulled through the book but there are so many little funny scenes in this book it just um and I really don't usually laugh loudly when I'm read or at all when I'm reading it I was laughing a lot so oh um, I'm so glad yeah. yeah that was one of my goals is to write there aren't necessarily so many books aimed at at girls or young or young women that right um, comedy focus so I was very happy to get to play in that area and and I like you know I'm used to performing on stage so scenes have to move fast sure and you have to keep the audience's attention and so my biggest note for my editor was like okay those are great now let's have a few slow down scenes (laughs) between because it can't just keep going 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 um but yeah it was wonderful and it's also I think some of my skills and my other background is journalism is just talking yeah. and chatting with people worked out because I was asking him what he did in the canoe and y- you just never know yeah. uh, where a, com- a simple conversation can, can turn, can lead. Right. right. Yeah. Um, yes. And also I, I should add, um, the story is very heartfelt. It's not, it's not all just, you know, laugh, 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 fluffy. I mean, it's, it's, there's some um really sweet heartfelt moments so you you did you achieved that that balance of um you know depth and and levity that I think can be tricky yeah I think one of my most rewarding things is uh, meeting real uh kids who've read the book and are are also feel like social outcasts and awkward and they really relate to those heartfelt moments which has been really gratifying. I think most of us feel that way, but we don't realize that everyone else does. Right, 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 right. Definitely. Um, okay. Well, I've got you. Why don't let's move to um, your opening scene. I want all of you. I, I, we're not going to have any spoilers, but we're going to talk about all three of your opening scenes because I'm <laughs> all all of your books. I mean, you read that first chapter and bam, we're off and running. So hilarious. Uh, Can you just talk a little bit about that opening scene? Yeah, I decided, uh, again, I sort of approached it how I would writing a comedy sketch, which is that Willa is on a horse um, at at, uh, the the lessons and things go wrong. And And, and I have to just, the horse's name is Clyde Lee, which is... (laughs) So Clyde is, yeah, ha- Clyde is half Clydesdale, half thoroughbred. Mm-hmm. And he was actually inspired by my sister's real lesson horse when we were kids, named Clyde Lee. Yeah. So I totally swiped that from the real horse who was half Clydesdale. And he's this giant, like it's, it, you can't even describe how big he is. I say his hooves are the size of a medium pizza. Yeah. And it's often these big horses who are really great with young kids and inexperienced yeah. riders. They just have this gentleness about them, the biggies. And so, so Willa is on, she feels awkward in her body and he's oversized. So they both feel sort of, they're, they're not quite perfect in their bodies, but they're going for it anyway. So she's on top of of uh, Clyde Lee and the other girls are in their fancy decor with their fancy horses that they own. This is a borrowed rescue horse that she has. And he goes a little rogue and it's an action scene. Um, 
uh, and you get a little bit of her backstory at the same time and you get all the emotions and mm -hmm. inner dialogue going through her as she's panicking as this horse goes rogue in the stable, which does happen, especially with yeah. inexperienced riders. Mm -hmm. And it's happening in front of all the horse girls and the horse boys and the parents in the stable. So you have the mortification factor mm -hmm. and her dad is like, hang on, kiddo, <laughs> you know, just, just mortifying her further. So yeah, I, I wanted a real, almost like a set piece to start with. It it was it, that's exactly what it, it was a perfect set piece and really just set the tone for for so many things that happen later um okay alda like it's shifting gears um to your book your opening scene and the 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 scene where the um where um the little girl where petra is saving her father can you talk about that scene yeah, that's, uh, I want to say that's part of a, it's a flashback she gets in chapter one, because yeah. that's a prologue. Yeah, that's right. a, a bony pro, a prologue right. that yeah. sets the mood about the comet. And then the second um, a chapter, or the first chapter, uh, she does have that flashback about her father being in, the, in front of the firing squad. And that scene came to me from all the old photographs that I researched. And uh, there's a lot of men that were forced to join the Mexican Revolution by the established uh, Federal Army. So they would come down, the Mexican Army, they would come down the Federalists and uh, just uh, force men to join them. And if they refused to, they would uh, execute them. So I saw many photographs uh, similar to those, and I wanted to bring that into the, the book. And I weaved it into Petra's story that she sees the moment she sees her father and the the chaos you know in her own mind and just watching her daughter and her dad about to get executed when he finally decides to okay i'm gonna have my daughter go through this so i will join you know even though i detest it and disagree i will join just so that she you know spare her that that moment so it, it just goes on from there yeah and i mean what a um what an illustration of, of her character and her bravery and um, her agency also, you know, just, um, I don't know, it, it, that scene told me so much about her, about her father, mm -hmm. um, and what was, what was to come. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I read that and I just said, well, I'm doing nothing else for the next few hours because, you know, I'm, <laughs> I have, I have to, I have to know. So anyway, that it was incredible. It was incredible. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's it's a book about war, so it's yeah. not it's not yeah. to, you know, But uh, I try to. It, it was a challenge trying to present it in such a way that kids could um, uh, be able to grasp the, the the war and its effects, and yet not be overly gruesome or right, or right, right. That's that's hard. That's hard to do. Um, all right, so Gilbert, um, your first chapter, you think you sort of know, you think you're like, ah, this is all fake, and then boom, right at the end of that first chapter, um, Maria gets a, or does, writes a note, so talk about, talk a little bit about your first chapter and how it sort of set the, set the stage for us. Yeah, so it begins with Maria inside her mother's walk-in closet peeking through a grate into the um, living room where Madame Destine, Maria's mother, is conning a widow out of her inheritance. And she's basically um, channeling the ghost of her late husband, who is trying to persuade her to um, give away her last treasure, her wedding ring, to a, a children's organization that may or may not be fake. So Maria's job is to turn on the fan to make sure that the ghost wind can go through the grates and when at the right moment and then turn it off. And something goes wrong because Mr. Fox, the helper downstairs in the basement, can't hear what's going on. So there's a little bit of drama there. And then at the very end, Maria lays down on her, on her mattress in the walk-in closet and um, she feels Edward's presence and he basically takes her hand and she automatically writes a note from Edward. And automatic writing is something practiced by the spiritualists who believe that ghosts are real and they basically your subconscious is writing a, um, a note. And I'd gotten that from seeing a psychic um, who was talking to Elvis, I guess Elvis was her spirit guide. And she demonstrated how, um, how she did it. And 
he basically put a pen between her knuckles and then carried it over the page and wrote a message from Elvis. And do you want to know what Elvis said? Please. We all need to know. I'm here to give you proof that the afterlife is real and you better believe it. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> so was this part of your research to visit? So part of my research, yeah. So oh, I think no. the, I, there was this museum that had, um, that dealt with that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and they were going to have a, um, a woman from England who was coming down and she had a spirit guide and she was going to tell us about it. And so that was it. We had to be very quiet. She put the pen between her knuckles and wrote this like chicken scratch kind of note. And that was what it said. Wow. Wow. Okay. Well, and while I've got you, let's, um, I want to, I want to talk to each of you about your main character's journey because um, in, in your book, Gilbert, your main character, uh, Maria is being led by these uh, automatic writing notes from Edward. So talk a little bit about, and I mean, she has a great journey to lots of cool places. So can you just talk a little bit about your main character's journey and how you led her through? Sure. So the automatic writing is, I tie it in with the beats because the mm -hmm. beat poets were also writing from their subconscious. And um so there's sort of modern writing was sort of through that. Jack Kerouac would continuously write on a long scroll of a piece of paper and just keep typing. And whatever would come out of the subconscious would just empty out onto the page. So that was, I tied that in. It's basically a story where Maria, although she's looking for, um, although she's looking for a treasure hidden in this widow's apartment, what she's really discovering is her love for writing and her friendships that she meets along the way. And a little bit about um, the widow's past, which she was, she traveled with the Beats who wrote poetry. And um, she was a jazz singer and um, knew a lot of the artists from the 1950s. So that's, you get a little bit of that and mixed in with it. Yeah, it was a cool, um modern history lesson of, I mean, you, you brought in Jackson Pollock and the jazz age and all the poetry and uh, that, that was a fun, that's a fun journey for the reader as well as, as Maria. Um, yeah. yeah, that, that was fun. Um, Carrie, uh, your journey, uh, you, you had um, these mysterious notes, poems, um, that that um, Willa was receiving. So talk a little bit about how how the the notes led her through her journey. Yeah. So part of Willa's journey is really trying to make friends, to make human yeah. friends, um, not just horse friends, right? But imaginary friends, and that's part of um, her her struggle. And she doesn't have much hope, but these notes that she finds mysterious notes in her her bags and different places, they're a thread of hope for her. And I think we might, we may talk about this some more, but her mother is in the Air Force and stationed overseas. So she's, she's really missing her mom. Um, and her, and she does have her dad and sister. She has a, a great family taking care of her, but she's really missing her mom and mm -hmm. she's struggling to fit in. So, so these notes are just, just the hope that she needs to keep yeah. going. Yeah. At this, at the same time, her journey is taking care of her new friend, Clyde this horse who provides unconditional friendship and love. And I'm not really going to give a spoiler, yeah. but, but he, there, there's, you know, he, something goes wrong with Clyde and she has to figure out a way to help her friend. So these two stories are intertwined and braided, braided together because every horse story has to have a horse in peril or it just, can't, it cannot be a horse story. Right. Um, and they wanted to deal with that in a very realistic way yeah. um, that not, not everything is such an easy fix, both in the human world and the horse world. Well, and I loved um, the notes she got were so positive and encouraging um, when, when things were not going so well. And, um, yeah, to, for her to have that little bit of hope. Yeah, uh, and I think a lot of um, in adolescence and puberty, you feel like everyone just hates you or you're just not going to, just, oh, everyone's, I'm messing up in every way. And the truth is maybe, maybe you do have fans and maybe you have to open yourself up a little bit to find that friendship. Yeah. And, and to find the people who really care and to allow yourself to trust other people instead of just keeping in your shell. And that's mm -hmm. part of adolescence, right? Opening up out of your little inner core and 
exploring the world and mm -hmm. it takes bravery and courage. Mm -hmm. And sometimes and you I need a little, a little help, you know? A little help. And all three of your books actually did that. You know, your, your characters started, you know, a little more isolated and, and their world opened up because of things they were doing. Um, yeah. So, uh, um, sorry, Alda. <laughs> Talk about Petra's journey and her, you know, um, barefoot dreams and I, her feet literally took her through her journey and her feet were uh, talked about a lot. Um, so could you talk a little bit about her, her journey and, and what kept her going? Sure. Throughout the research I did, there are so many things that happened in the Mexican Revolution, so many uh, people's lives changed. It, it touched every corner of Mexico, and uh, and I wanted to be able to weave in a lot of those uh, those people's stories and narratives into the into the novel. And as she travels, uh, she ends up in a church in an old convent, and there she meets a white girl, young little girl who uh, is a daughter of a of a mine engineer or, or chemist uh, scientist. But uh, I wanted to put that in there because there's a lot of foreigners there. And that was one of the reasons the New Mexican Revolution started, too. And then I also wanted to take her to the, the rebel camp. She comes across rebels, a group of rebels, and wanted to show the, the roles that women played because they were so prominent. Women were so prominent during the revolution, especially in the rebels. You had the women camp followers who would follow their husbands and... Mm -hmm sons and fathers into the war and, and help them feed them and whatnot. And you also had the, the women soldiers, the, the warriors who achieved ranks as high as generals in, in the rebel army in back in 1913, that was unheard of around the world. So I wanted her to experience that, to see a woman soldier and, and be able to interact with her. And uh, so, yeah, and later on the desert, of course, plays a big part because my, my great grandmother too crossed the desert trying to get to the United States. And uh, and just meeting people, you know, in, in between that journey, so throughout that journey, so yeah, it's it's it was an interesting uh, way to try to get all the as many characters in there. <laughs> yeah, and so and you've touched on this just a little bit. Um, I do want to talk about the moms in 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 all of your books. So you know, Gilbert, you have a bad mom, and Carrie, absent absent mom, and. Petra's mother had had died. Um, could you talk a little bit about how that informed her character? And also, she she had strong women, like you you just mentioned that she um, her her grandmother was with her. Uh, was it Marietta, the um, yeah. woman? Um, could you talk a little bit about about how not having a mother informed her personality and her relationship with these women? Yes, I, I've noticed that when uh, kids uh, don't have a parent present, whether the parent's away or working, you know, two shifts or whatnot, the, the kid tends to grow up quickly. <laughs> you know, they have to in order to survive, especially if they have younger siblings. And uh, I, I speak from personal experience, too, you know, and, and also my great grandmother, her mother had died and that made her grow up quickly as well. So I wanted to put that in Petra. And also when you're that child, you, you tend to just grasp at whatever and mentor or whatever opportunity presents itself in terms of someone's willing to teach you something, you just grab onto that. So I wanted Petra to have that same uh, emotion when she met uh, women that were you know, powerful and stuff like that, that she wanted that mentorship, that, uh, that knowledge too. And, and some of her, her grandmother's ideas were, were dated, you know, were holding her back. And I, I thought she handled that well because she she loved her grandmother, but then she started seeing these other women doing different things and um, maybe yeah. empowered her a little bit beyond what she had grown up with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just that in generational uh, point of views, especially even in, as uh, myself, I was an immigrant and my mother and even the fact that we're both immigrants, we saw things differently, sure. just being from different generations. So I wanted to put that as well with Petra and her her grandmother. Yeah, that uh, that relationship was um, 
was so uh, it was so complicated and 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 beautiful I, I oh, thank you yeah I, I really um I, I enjoyed reading it um so so Carrie um I loved that Willa's mother is off in the Air Force like being a pilot which was awesome and um the the sacrifices that families make and the relationship with her older sister her dorky dad um and the horse trainer so can you just talk a little bit about how her mother's absence affected affected her yeah this was inspired by i grew up in an air force town and okay. so you would see the parent parents who are being deployed they dash into school to do a quick hug goodbye before they deployed and this, so this is a reality for yeah. air force families and it was also a bit of an easter egg because my dad's a pilot ah. and my my other project the flying flamingo sisters is um inspired by my grandfather's flying circus from the 1930s so i wanted to get a little aviation in so i thought let's make the mom a pilot um and it it forces willa to make that step that all of us do in adolescence where we move from our family out into the broader world and, and find mentors, much as Alda was saying. So Willa's, the figures in her life who help guide her are her horse trainer, uh, Georgia, her older sister, Kay, and her dad, of course. And so I think if we're lucky along the way, we have many, many people guiding us and taking us through life. And Willa's just forced to take that step maybe before she she would want to because her mom her mom's away she's lucky that the story we i use zoom and texting and all sorts yeah. of things her mom is able to drop in and help guide her as well even though she's away um i liked i didn't realize when i wrote it that zoom would become so much <laughs> part of our culture but it it happened to feel very much yeah. feels very current when you're reading it because that's what we're all doing right now with our families um, I, I also like that you let her show some anger at her mom for being gone. You know, that, um, I mean, that's a very real emotion that she, she would have had, you know, I, I like that. Yeah. you let that. She's really mad at her. She's really mad at her mom. Yeah. Willa's out of line a lot. She yeah. makes mistakes. It's, I mean, it's not her mom's, but her mom's yeah. doing the right thing, but right. she, oh, is she so mad at her mom? And yeah. she's so mad at her dad. Like, and yeah. that's how that's what they are right there's a lot of real. a lot of anger and uh yeah and i wanted her to make mistakes she was yeah. she's nowhere close to perfect she's constantly yeah. making mistakes she and i love digging into that <laughs> she made a lot of mistakes but and funny mistakes though too you know that um yeah that, big and uh, small humorous yeah. and then yeah golly <laughs> yeah yeah uh, so, so Gilbert, what, what a terrible mom! <laughs> oh, yeah, and this and the serious messenger, the caretaker, is um, the villain. So she's um, although there's a twist, I can't go into. Yeah. Whole thing, but um, I similar to the other books, I guess in all middle grade, you kind of have to get the main character, the child, away from the parents some way, and either yeah. they're an orphan or the parents are divorced or they're at summer camp. There's some so. Maria's adventure really doesn't happen unless um, Madame Destine is not around because she right. can't know that Maria is talking to a spirit, a real one, because she might pump her for information or who knows what she'll do. Mm -hmm. So most of the growth happens away from, away from Madame Destine. Mm -hmm. And she really latches on to um, Ms. Fisher yeah. um, as a, you know, as a kind of a mother or grandmother figure and, um, she really, and the librarian, I loved the role of the librarian in your book. She, she did have other people watching out for her. Thank goodness. Um, so yeah, I, 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 um, I just, I, I loved this evil mother the whole time. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, <laughs> this <is a> child. <laughs> um, so I want to talk a little bit about the research you all did because we've we've touched on it a little bit, but Gilbert, you researched the the beat poets, uh, a real psychic. Did you spend some time at the New York Public Library? Tell me what else you did. Yeah, I have a, I have a friend that works at the New York Public Library, and he actually took me down. I guess they store all the books down the, um, in the basement underneath Bryant Park, 
And they think of the shelves move in together and move back and forth on a track. It's kind of interesting, but um, he works, he, we talked a little bit about the, um, just, uh, you know, going to the library and how you would go about checking out the, um, you know, the material that they had to research for the, the beat poets. And there is a room there and they do go there to get that kind of stuff and all that. <laughs> Very cool, very cool. And um, Carrie, I learned so much. You know, I have a horse daughter, but and she'll throw out these these words that I don't know. And in your book, um, you even you gave us uh, I, I don't think you can see, but definitions. We had footnotes um, with with the definitions of of different equestrian things, and and they were funny. Um, could you talk a little bit? You said your sister was a, was a hashtag horse girl. Yeah. Um, so I call, we call them hoof notes. So uh, hoof they notes. Help, help explain. This is my editor's really good idea, um, that we needed a little help for the regular readers who don't yeah. know anything about horses. Um, and so that I've gotten such great feed feedback about from parents actually, mostly, <laughs> um, and yeah, my sister was was huge into horses. We both were actually. Okay. We went to horse camp, which was just like a rinky dink YMCA camp that had like one hour of horses. It wasn't a real horse camp, uh, but she she loved it. I loved it, but I was allergic to horses, okay. so I got dropped in piano lessons, and she got to keep taking horse lessons. So you were K. The sister who was allergic. So I am the older sister. In the I got gotcha. I'm kind of uh, a bit of the mean, the mean big sister. That's my, my character. <laughs> and my younger sister was the inspiration for Willow. Okay. And I used to go and watch her ride and just absorb the lessons. And it's really a love letter to her. And she had such grace and passion and just, just pure love for these horses. It was her obsession. And she was so kind. We we sat and talked for hours. I asked her, you know, for all the memories, all the anecdotes that she had that I might be able to use. Um, and then I did a ton of reading horse, you know, anatomy books and, right. and writing books and talking to trainers and, and girls who were taking lessons because it's that kind of world horse girls really care. You cannot get anything wrong or they will be so upset. Well, yes. And, and, and that is one thing um, I think is especially true of middle grade novels is you better get everything exactly right or you will be called out and everything from, from the details to the voice. You, you really, I, I think it's the hardest um, genre. I really do because you really have to get it right. You do. They will let you know if you yep. don't. Um, I liked that I was writing about a novice because I was a novice to this world. So I got to learn as Willow was learning. So that was really, yeah. Really yeah. Cool. Well, and I think maybe that helped to, um, it helped explain it to, to us, to the parents, like you said, because you were learning too. Um, and, and I did my, my daughter came home from, from camp and she was the ox. What's the jump? The ox. The something. oxer. The oxer, she, she was telling me about falling over an oxer. And I said, I know, I know what that is now. You don't have to tell me. Um, so Alda, your research, so you talked about your great grandmother's story and all of your, all of your research and um, talk a, a little bit about, you know, the, the headline in the, that article that really led you to this story from your research. Yeah, it was a, an event that happened because everybody, thousands of people, or she, she thought it was hundreds, but it was yeah. actually thousands of people that crossed the desert and anyways through train by foot, both, you know, any way to get to the border. And once she got there, the, the border was shut. The U.S. has shut the border. So people were waiting. And uh, then there was. Uh, what, what year was, was it? 1917? 13, 1913. Mm -hmm. So they, the border was shut and, and people were waiting for the border to open and were not and knowing that the federales were approaching and not until the federales actually showed up in a town and expectedly that's when chaos just broke loose and everybody dashed to the to the bridge and were begging for their lives, clinging to the gates for them to be opened. And, and that's when my great grandmother recalled being there at that bridge 
and just she said it was just uh, nerve wracking. Everybody just screaming for the lives because they knew they were going to get slaughtered. They had been told that you know if you try to escape, you will be be killed. So at that point, moment, you know, just the U.S. opened the gates, and you know, my great grandmother and her family were able to run through and and make it safely to to the U.S. side. And uh, a couple of my cousins that uh, went with them didn't make it over there. And uh, later on, once they reconnected, uh, one of them had, uh, they both ran, but uh, one of them uh, was caught by the Federals and was actually executed. And the other one uh, made it far away that he joined the rebels and, and later on reconnected. But uh, yeah, it got really violent for the people that stayed behind. They couldn't cross that bridge on, on time. So yeah, you know, it's pretty, pretty uh, I, exciting. I, I, I knew, knew nothing about the Mexican Revolution, like zero. And um, so I've got lots of um, tabs pulled up on my computer where I've been reading about it. And um, it's such a, uh, the story, all of your, your story and everything that happened is so relevant today. Yeah, it's. It's amazing with the pictures, the black and white pictures that I did research. One of them, it shows families walking through the desert and they're walking by the railroad tracks. And then I found a modern picture from two months ago and put them side by side. And I was just amazed how similar they are. And, and that same bridge where my great grandmother crossed, that's the same bridge we see now in the news about people trying to cross and waiting there and whatnot. And the refugee camps too, the one my great grandmother was in, you know, you see the the scares, the smallpox scares, what, what was happening at that time. And you see COVID. And so it's just your semblance. It's amazing how many similarities you have. Have you have you visited the, the bridge? In, have you seen it in person? Or Yeah, I used to travel back and forth a lot. Uh, I grew up in San Antonio, but going to Mexico during the summer, so I'd always uh, go through that bridge. So I always thought about that, driving through that bridge, that that's where it happened. And uh, and the bridge looks different back then, back in 1913. And, and that's another thing. Once I found that picture, I knew the date. And with that date, I was able to find pictures. And there's two, three photographs of, of somebody snapped pictures during that time where people were running. And to know that my great grandmother is somewhere in that crowd, it's just wow. it was mesmerizing. Wow. Although That's you must have had, I mean, just goosebumps when you found. <laughs> yeah, when I saw that picture, I'm like, oh my goodness, you know, seeing the, the fear in the people's face, especially the kids, because I knew my great grandmother was that age. And uh, oh my how goodness. Old, how old was she? She was nine when she crossed that, that bridge. Yeah. Um, at where, where did you do your research? A lot of it was from uh, family stories, but then to do the facts, I, I read a lot of stuff on the uh, Mexican Revolution, a lot of books, but I just got the the big, you know, the political figures and whatnot and generals and all that. I didn't really get the narratives of the people, which is what I was interested in. So a lot of it I had to dig through newspapers mm -hmm. and uh, from journalists who would interview people or refugees and whatnot and thank god for those uh, those articles because those journalists and uh because they got the they went down to the the people and actually got their stories so i was able to incorporate a lot of it experiences and feelings and emotions from that and one of them john reed was a big uh, journalist at that time and wrote a whole book he actually traveled with rebel forces and interviewed a lot of them and uh, made a book. So I was really grateful for stuff like that. And that, that helped a lot with the research. Incredible. Um, so we're, we're close to being out of time. I, do any of you have questions you would like to ask each other? Wow, I'm, I'm just, I want to add that, oh my goodness, your books sound wonderful, you know, just I- <laughs> They are so good, yeah. all, all three. All, um, yeah. Yeah, the, the mystery and the, that's something I want to write eventually, but I'm, I'm so I'm looking at your book over now. I'm like, okay, I got to study that book so I could, could nail that down. And the comedy, that is so difficult to, to nail down as well. So yeah, that, they're my list so I could study them. <laughs> I know, I can't wait. To, I, I'm so excited for both of your books. So I have, so Gilbert, how did you plot the the mystery? Did you know, did you have it all figured out? I did, you... 20 pages. I left enough things open to where I would have to think it through. And then I probably wrote about 50 pages before I knew what was gonna happen. And then 
as a, by the middle, I knew how it would end, you know, um, lots of walks and parks and it's fun. It's true. That's, that's the only way to solve it sometimes, walking <laughs> away from the computer. <laughs> exactly. Well, and also we, we were saying before, before we, we got on, um, Gilbert's, Gilbert's book is, is this really fun journey through New York. The, the characters, you know, go to MoMA and the library and all these fun places. It would be a really fun walking tour to, to follow in the footsteps of, of Maria. Well, you guys should all visit me in New York. And I know, so Gilbert's about to move back to Brooklyn. Oh, great. Been living in Jackson for the last year, I guess. So when COVID hit, I ended up packing all my stuff up and moving it into my parents' garage. And I've been living with my parents for a year. And um, not only that, but we live right across the street from the high school I used to go to. So basically, okay. I'm a young adult. <laughs> so who knows what's going to happen in the future <laughs> with books. Probably very inspiring for writing <laughs> Living with your parents. Oh, and, and let's quickly talk about what you're all working on now before we sign off. So what are you working? Are you are you inspired from from being back in your childhood home and um, any 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 new books in the works, Gilbert? I have one that um, has been in limbo since COVID, but it's called The Cutting Edge. And I can't really go into it that much. It's another mystery and it takes place in Queens. Uh -huh. um, so that's in the works. And we'll Is that middle grade? It's middle grade. It's middle grade. Yeah. And Carrie, how about you? So um, I am working on this, the sequel to The Flying Flamingo Sisters, which is okay. a radio drama on uh, Audible Original. So it's kind of a mix of a script and a book. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, and so I'm in the midst of that now. I'm actually at my parents' house right now in Florida. So I, Gilbert, I feel you. Um, <laughs> but my, as it was also based on a real story of my grandfather's flying circus and I can use my dad as a resource for all that aviation right. uh, information and his memory of his father and all the clip news clippings we have. So it's, it's been, it's been great. Although a sequel is more challenging than I anticipated. So <laughs> I don't know, although if you feel the same way, but. Oh, yeah, yeah I, I feel like I had luxury of time for that first novel, you know, I had years and years and years, and this one, no, it's got to be turned now. There's a deadline now, so you know, it's it's work, but it, it's fun too to follow that character too into a new place and trying to figure out. I kind of like uh, Gilbert was talking about the psychics. I kind of let her talk through me, you know, and and see feel her vibe, see what she wants to do next. So so it's good. And yeah, like I mentioned earlier, I'm taking her to San Antonio and and I love. I'm, I grew up in San Antonio and I love that the buildings, the old buildings are still standing there. I don't know if you've read to the, uh, San Antonio, a lot of the old buildings are there. So I could see where Petra actually walked by and actually entered and what she saw. So it's, it's neat. So hopefully I, I could incorporate a lot of that old feeling, old San Antonio feeling, which is still there. I mean, we consider San Antonio, even though it's a big city, it still has that old uh, small town feeling to it. Are you so, still doing your physics or engineering work? <laughs> Great question. No, I had to, uh, you know, in order to make room. <laughs> to, no, I, I haven't. Uh, it, about 10 years ago, uh, my husband and I, we moved to Italy. We're military. So uh, we got stationed over there. And just when you're in Italy, I mean, you just got inspired with art and writing. And I said, okay, you know, I'm going to write now. <laughs> and I just couldn't help it. So that's what I started writing. And and uh, engineering kind of took a, <laughs> a backseat and it's been there for a while, <laughs> hopefully maybe one day, but the physics, I, that's what I, I still read a lot of physics and still watch shows. So I'm hoping I can incorporate that into a middle grade one day. So we'll see. <laughs> so cool. Very cool. Well, um, thank you all so much. I'm sorry we are not in person, but I'm glad you could all be here virtually. Um, I, I should say, everybody buy these three books, pre-order Alda's book, um, and buy from your independent bookstore. We in Mississippi are so lucky to have incredible independent bookstores, so 
support them and support these authors. And thank you all so much for being here. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure. Yeah. That's great. Bye. Right on Mississippi is produced in partnership with Mississippi Public Broadcasting for the Mississippi Book Festival, the South's literary lawn party.